listeners, welcome back to another Nobody Asked Us with Des and Kara Goucher, presented by TCS. I threw in your last name. It's kind of fancy. Sorry. <laughs> I totally noticed. I was oh like, wow, gosh. she's fancifying me. At Kara Goucher, presented by at TCS. You have like a really good like radio voice right now. <laughs> I don't, but uh, that's my broadcaster voice that they're like, please stop doing that. <laughs> <Shoot>. <laughs> no, they're not. Yeah. Come on. How's it going? What's new? What's the latest? Things are good. Summertime, which is nice. Horseflies are out, which is not. <laughs> you know? Do you guys get horseflies in Michigan? They're like the most tenacious things ever. They're like horrible. If you want a lesson in being gritty and never giving up and like going the extra mile, channel a horsefly. Why are they so <laughs> terrible and why do they exist? I don't know. That's a like good what question. do they do for the ecosystem? Like I you, ask Adam all the time. I'm like, yeah. why? Why are they here? They like take chunks out of you, actual chunks. It's like a horror movie. Yeah, like you'll go through a trail <laughs> and you're like, there's just a cloud and you see it in the shadow before you see them, and then they start to orbit you. <laughs> and then it's you're so running true. as fast as you can. And they just and they like, can they stay with you? <laughs> yeah, they don't. They don't like they. It's yeah. incredible how long they'll follow you, and it doesn't matter what you do. I hate them so much. I just yeah. don't understand why they're a thing. That's a great question. I don't know what they add, but um, good for endurance. And then you have to run in the water, and they're still like, yeah. Our oh, old no. pup, yeah, used to be Lord of the Flies because like he was really stinky, and then he would roll around in the dirt, and then they would just like cloud oh. him. And then he would roll around in the dirt and then more would come. <laughs> just like, get in the water. Go. Get down, get down. Yeah. Yes. I know. My son will be swimming and then he'll he he'll be with his cousin swimming and then they'll just start screaming and ducking under the water <laughs> and they'll go, ah, and they'll go in the water. I'm like, this is like a horror movie. Why do, are horse flies a thing? Do they go on the water tr trampoline? They do. <laughs> they think it's like going to be safe out there, but no place is safe from the horse flies. Tell me about the trampoline. We talked a little bit about it before we got on this call, and um, I just need to know more the dynamics, how the setup goes, and then the enjoyment of it all. Okay, Break it down so for me. When I was a kid, our neighbors had one, and we weren't allowed to go on it, and I was so jealous. I was always so jealous. And then, like neighbors across the lake that we don't Terrible. know very well, oh, okay. you know. And I just right. so I would just be so jealous. And so last year, I was like, we're getting a water trampoline. And I was like, what? And I was like, I always wanted one. <laughs> we have this space. We're doing this. So it comes. It's a 15-footer. It is so hard to put together. It's not like putting an outdoor trampoline together where you just like put in the springs and attach the metal thing. There's like also this giant ring that you have to blow up that takes forever that's so heavy. And then you're like <laughs> wiggling it on your dock. Your dock's about to crash. And then you have to go put it in the water. And last year, we, we didn't think it through and we just got like two cinder blocks. And the next morning, we woke up and it was across the lake. <laughs> okay. And so – Get that back. Yeah. Last year, it took Adam and I about eight hours to put it together and get it in the water. And we were like so mean to each other by the end. We were like, this yeah. is so fucking stupid. Da, da, da. I didn't know like getting divorced. This year, we were like, hey, let's not do what we did last year. And we like let – we left the – um like the springy part put together so we didn't have to put that together, but we still had to like blow it up and attach it and put the safety on and bring it out. So it took about four hours this year. And the same thing, we were almost progress. divorced by the time it was done. <laughs> but sort of progress. I will say the kids love it so much, and like you can't get them up from the lake. They they, they think it's so fun. So it's we were talking before, like would I buy it again? Mm, probably not. But now we have it. <laughs> I and thought it was going to be a it. probably. Yeah, the kids love it so much. That I can't imagine not putting it in every year. But then like that's the whole thing. Then you have it's not like a trampoline that just sits. Oh, the, our trampoline in Colorado. Oh, it doesn't matter if it snows on it. Like no, you have to get it out. Take it apart. Carry. We live on a giant hill. End of the There's summer, though, right? This is one. Yeah, one. end of the summer. Bookends. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I when I was a kid, I didn't realize like I grew up water skiing and tubing and all that stuff, and I didn't realize how much work the adults were doing to get all this <laughs> stuff ready. Right. So now it's like, oh, Uncle Adam and Aunt Carrie here. They have the toys, but the kids don't realize like. And you know, like, we got to drop in the boat. We got to get the dock in. We have to make sure it's in the right position. We have to put all the bumpers on. We have to get it. You know, it's like there's a lot that goes into what I remember as just like hopping on the boat and going tubing as a kid. And so it's been funny to be from this point of view. I'm like a little bit more like grateful to the adults in my life when I was a kid because <laughs> I didn't appreciate just how much work it is. No, that's good. Um, that's good you say that because it makes me appreciate Ryan because I still don't do much. 
like he does most of it. Um, I had this, okay, here's my million dollar idea. This could get like edited because maybe it'll be too risque. But there's a Instagram channel, Hot Dudes Reading. Do you follow mm. that? It's no. just photos. It's just photos of men reading that are like attractive men reading. And Ryan does like all this stuff around the house. And I always like joke around and I take a photo. It's like lady porn. Like <laughs> this is attractive for a woman. Like this yeah. guy is doing housework or whatever. So he's building a deck right now. And he oh. was out like with his shirt off and like just doing like all this like manly stuff and then like, you know, building something. That's a, so I put a photo up as lady porn. And then I was like, I should make an account called like lady porn. And it'll just be hot men building things. And then the profile will be, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> I was okay. like, where is this going to be to racing? And then I was like, there it is. <laughs> so hot dudes reading is like a, like a million followers. Like this account could be huge. We could get a I think book you need deal. To do it. We could like mm-hmm. get a coffee table book. If you yes. build it, they will come. <laughs> I, I love it. And I can think like... Yeah. My husband does a lot of stuff like that too, where I'm like, uh, like, even if I hate him, I'm like, wow, he's really hot. Like, this will be okay. Just because he's like building things. Yeah. <laughs> well, right, but I he can't do the trampoline by himself. <laughs> That's the problem. It's too much of a job. Otherwise, I would just make him do it. But anyway. Okay. Well, okay. So now we've heard about the trampoline. So now yes. we all want to know our beloved Des Linden. How is the training going? Is the hand fully healed? Are you back up and running? I know you've been dealing with allergies. But are you yeah. able to get back out there and train? The hand's been really good. Um, like, I'm going to do a scar update. It looks pretty good, I think. Get closer. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's like, it looks, it's kind of gross still, but it like, it's moving while I'm doing stuff. Um, <clears throat> eventually, I'll forget about it. You know, like, oh, what hand was it? And then I'll look down and be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's like the next step. So that's been good. I feel like as soon as I felt really good about the hand, then the allergy stuff kicked in. And then I was like, oh, I can't see. At least I can use my hands. Um, <laughs> but I think that that's going to go away. And I'm doing just mileage right now. Um, I'm going to probably do a fall marathon. It's not locked in yet. And I don't know what day this is going to come out, but I, I, I said on a podcast earlier that I would never coach people. Like, I just don't want to. But I am coaching an athlete right now for what? TCS New York City Marathon. So that'll be fun. Um, well, why the change of heart? Because literally, like, it was a couple days after the podcast. Brooks was like, would you like to coach this athlete <laughs> for this activation? And you were like, sure. like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm actually excited about the athlete. He's a competitor and i think he can run pretty well so that's awesome if, as long as i don't screw it up <laughs> you won't screw it up yeah you know so what you're doing fun. um that'll be fun and we'll announce that in august ish so cool very cool so yeah maybe i'll pick your brain for some ideas like what do you like about training for the marathon give me some new york city tips i mean <laughs> i'll give you my tips but you ran better everywhere than i did so i think you're doing fine Definitely not in New York, um, among other places. And then one place I did not run better than you was the World Championships, Kara. Oh, barely. Look at that. (laughs) Look at how I found the segue. (laughs) That was very, very good. Yes. We're going to talk about World Champs today and what that's like as a marathoner, correct? That's it. That's the topic. Um, So much experience. I mean, I think we've you ran on the track in multiple world championships at a really high level um, and in the marathon also at a really high level. And yeah, so I think it'll be fun to talk about. And we don't know, or I guess this will come out. We will know our team, but we don't know it right now. So we're going to leave the track out of this. for today. Yeah. We're only talking about the marathoners today because we know who's on that team. We do. Yeah. Do you want to, do you want to go through the names? No, you do it. Do you want to get right into it? Okay. You get, yeah, get into it. Well, actually, wait, hold on. Yeah. Let's back up for one second because okay. I'm curious why you decided to run the World Championship Marathon in 2009 because it is a descending order list. Some people pass. Some people say yes. So why did you decide to say yes? Um, that's a great question. I think that wasn't my – that might have been my first like real U.S. team. Like you can do Ekadens, which are kind of like you get the kit and, but it's not like a team. Like this was my first world championship team. Um, so I feel like 
getting the chance to represent the USA at that type of stage was just like too hard to pass up. Um, I had done a couple Chicago's at that point and was like, had good momentum. I'm trying to think of, I think I went 231. I missed the Olympic team in 2008 and that was like crushing, even though I wasn't really that close at the end, it felt like I was. Um, and then it was like, how can we get ready for the next trials? And so there was running a fast time, which Chicago kind of was closer. And then it was like getting the competition aspect of it. So running the world champs was like a really great place to do that as well. Um, yeah. And then we used to have a team component mm -hmm. for that, which was really cool. Yeah. There used to be five people on it instead of three. And then there was like a little team race within the race, which was really cool. Yeah. I kind of miss that. I wish they would bring that back. Me too. I mean, I'm like, they're bringing in all these mixed relays and now they're talking about some <laughs> other like sprint medley relay or something. I'm like, well, what, like what's two more marathoners out on the course? Like give the distance people some love, something fun to do. I liked that. Right. And it was actually really fun in 09. One of my college teammates, Tara Moody was on the team, which was really cool. Yeah. Who um, else was on that? Paige and Zoila. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was a good team. It was a good team. I actually have in my house downstate in the office is a photo. It's because it was my first world team. So the jer like Ryan put the jersey in the frame and then like a couple photos. Yeah. So that team, you're in my office. That's with awesome. Some, with the rest of the team on our wall. <laughs> I was excited to do it because I felt like I knew I wanted to run the marathon at the 2012 Olympics. Mm -hmm. And I felt like it was a good opportunity because a major and a world championship or Olympic marathon are totally different. Yes. Right. At the major is like, there, your water bottle's right there. There's like, you know, but at the World Champs, it's just everything about it's different. Call time's different. How you get your fluids during the race is different. Everything about it is so different. And I wanted to like make sure I knew what to expect when I got to hopefully London, which was, I did make that team with you and Shlaine, but I wanted to make sure like I knew what it was going to be like. So there were no surprises. You were also like a heavy metal favorite. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Like, yeah, I it say was. things. I say things, and then I'm like, someone's gonna make fun of this because I would make fun of this, and so I have to make, make fun, fun of myself of this. first. <laughs> so if you're watching YouTube, you'll see the hand motion that I'm like, uh, heavy metal. <laughs> um, but you were a favorite for a medal, I, in my opinion. Yeah. I thought like you were yeah. a serious, a very serious contender. So yeah, like, I was excited. And I, I felt like I was like <clears throat> trained really well. Like I had um, come off Boston. I had run New York, and then I had run Boston, and then I. My training for it went really well, and I'd come off of a good half. I think I had run – I flew on my way over to World Champs. I ran a half in Chicago, and I I want to say I ran like 68.03 or something like that, and I felt like I felt like I was in a really good place, and um, a couple of the heavy hitters in the race had dropped out, and I really felt like, ooh, this – like I could be on the podium. I mean, so much so that like Nike had me go get a haircut and be ready <laughs> when I was in Berlin. Um, it's crazy. But in the race, I just – I never felt totally, totally comfortable. It wasn't like I bombed. I think we ran like 220 – what did we run? Did we run 227? 227. 227? Mid. 227? You might have 226. No, no, no. We were right together. So if you ran 227, so did I. But I – it wasn't like a bomb. It just was like – it just wasn't going the way I thought it was going to go. And um, and I – you know, I – even though it was my third marathon, I, I – didn't have a ton of experience yet. And mm -hmm. so I think I made some kind of bad choices during the race, but I'm glad I went because I do feel like it did help me like just mentally know what to expect later on. And, and I had, I mean, I want to say I had fun. I don't know. Like, do you remember those singlets? Like I was bleeding so bad. It cut me so bad under like on my ribs and stuff. And was it the singlet or the pins or like, it was just like the, the bra. Oh. So you are a Jersey probably, I did. but I wore the like built in bra and like on the track, it never bothered me It's the same uniform I'd worn for years, yeah. but something about it over time, I was like, like blood coming down. And I was just like very, like just sad. I felt like, wow, I really thought, I mean, it was like, you know, we've all been there, but I was like, I actually thought I had a shot at a medal and I couldn't even see them finish, you know? So it was kind of like one of those moments where I was like, okay, I have a lot of work to do. But also that was my third marathon in nine or 10 months. And I was like, yeah, I need a break. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it. But, yeah. yeah. But I do remember finishing and then like not even seconds later you were finished. Like we were right together. It's like laser. Like yeah. 
Like had the race been 15 meters longer, you would have beat me for sure. You were coming so hard. Yeah. I mean, I think this is an interesting thing to dig into because how, like how was the racing different from a world marathon major championship? You know, like you have people like podiums matter. And mm-hmm. my, I remember my coach saying this to me, it was like the Olympic podium matters in the world championship podium matters and everywhere else, it's just a smaller check. <laughs> like, yeah. Like they true. don't roll out a Boston podium or a new, like, and they talk about it like they do, but like the only podiums that matter are Olympics and world championships. So like when you're out there racing, you're racing for podium. And interestingly enough, like the world championships has the five. So you have five Kenyans, five Ethiopians, five Italian, like whatever. And it's a little bit more depth in theory than the Olympics. Cause you just have the three, right. Um, same t- type of mentality, but like, I guess maybe talk about your mindset going into that and how you raced like f- for the podium instead yeah. of, you know, I think when I ran New York, it was very easy because Paula was in the race. So it was like follow Paula. And then when I mm-hmm. ran Boston, there wasn't necessarily like an individual with a name that was like that big. Obviously, she was the world record holder at the time, but it was kind of like just follow the leaders. I felt like at World Champs, I was looking for, I want to say her last name was Mitatinko. She was Russian, but she was German and she was running really well. She had won London, I think that year. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had been in San Moritz and she was there training and everything. So kind of my race plan was to just run with her. And then she dropped out at the last minute, like literally the day before. And so- but this is the problem with not not having your own race plan because what like looking back I probably knew I was in about 224 shape I should have just made it happen you know right. but instead I was sort of sitting back and watching it happen and then there was athletes there was a couple of Japanese athletes and a, a Chinese athlete that I didn't know that were pushing the pace. It just felt like, I don't really know what's happening. I don't know these women. I don't know how they race. And so that's a problem when you base your entire race strategy off of one woman. You know, when she's not there, you're kind of like, well, I don't know. And then I just remember feeling really physically exhausted and probably it was just too much training. I mean, now we see people race multiple marathons a year, but back then we just did two a year, right? Yeah. Well, it was yeah. also hot. It was a it later, was hot. It was a later start. It was hot. And I and oh, the other thing I did was um I had this powdered powerade that I was training with and I brought it there. But then like three days before I was drinking this grapefruit powerade and it tasted so good. <laughs> and I was like, I really like this. So Alberto went out and got like a ton of it, and that's what I used in my bottles. But when I was racing, it felt like I was squeezing a grapefruit. It like the uh, flavor profile was so oh, different no. when I was running hard versus when I was just like sitting around drinking it. And then also I found out later that the, um, I don't know how to say it. I, w- I want to say composition, but I know that's not the right word, but like, it's just different nutritionally than American Powerade. Like the formula is different. Mm-hmm. So I think the combination of that and then it tasting really sour, like I was throwing up during that race. Like my mom kept going, why did you keep grabbing those sponges? And I was like, cause I was wiping throw off, I was wiping throw off, up my, off my face. So I just didn't have the day that I had helped for and drummed for. I, I was proud of myself for finishing. Cause it was like, everything was going wrong in my mind. It was like, oh my God, mm-hmm. all these people are expecting this stuff. And I still finished, but, and I learned a lot, but it was just, it was not the day I had hoped for. Let's just say that. What was, um, you talked about the world marathon majors and like the water bottles and all of the like things being set up. What were the differences, particularly with the water bottles, the fluid stations? Cause I think this is kind of, they'll probably show this on the coverage. Like how is that different from the majors? So as you know, at the majors, it's kind of stretched out and it's Mm -hmm. like there's multiple tables just for the elite women and like your bottles are all apart from each other. So there's no – like, yeah, sure, maybe three people are going for one long table, but the bottles are stretched out. At the World Champs and Olympics, it's like one table has multiple countries and it's tiny and you're this whole pack of people is going over. And I remember at the Olympics, Shalane and I were kind of helping grab each other's bottles almost because it was like so tight. And like I gave her room on one and then she gave me room the next time we were kind of trading. Um, But I was, that was like crazy to me. I felt like it was so much more stressful to get my bottle. And I think they can actually kind of hand it to you at the world championships. A USA team member can, which is good at the time. It made me feel panicked, but then like there's a big arm coming out with your water (laughs) bottle. Right. And you're like, Oh no, this is a good idea. I'm going to grab that. So just all those things are very different. And the field is bigger right? Because you have like back then in 09, we had five people from each country. So it just feels 
more intense and everyone's kind of together and everyone's going for the bottle at the same time. Like, did you feel that panic? I was by myself for a lot of it. No. Oh. <laughs> but um, actually, I, I brought that up because it is very different and like it's something to just insiders can look for it now on TV and be like, okay. Um, but at the Rio games, they had two volunteers per country and they had to man the, the water stations. And so like me, Amy and Shalane are all kind of, we're running around the same pace. And like, I think it was Tracy Sumlin or so, I don't know who the volunteer, was, but he's like trying to manage three bottles. And he's like, I have two hands. <laughs> like, right. You guys get what you get. And then when we started to break up, it was like, oh, okay. Like I can get it. Or they could have just set it on the table, but like, there's all these weird little things. And that is such an interesting learning from world champs that you're prepared sort of prepared for for the games because you're like okay this is going to be different than the majors where i know i'm a table four spot right. two or whatever right. like, and it's, always it's like be there. all of the countries of the nations yeah and so the u.s is like at the back well they're also like it's are- going to be in alphabetical order of the language so i'm like are we estados unidos <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> united right, states right. like where yeah, am where? i where yeah, where was sorry. it in rio was it it Under was with you? the U, but okay. I was looking at the E's. <laughs> and so I will say that is challenging because we're one of the last. And so you have this wall of women going in front of you and you're still kind of trying to look like looking for the USA flag and then looking for your handler who's going to hand you your bottles. <laughs> so I do think like going to the world champs, like I think that would have freaked me out in London, but because I had done it, it didn't freak me out as much. Like I knew what to expect. So there's you a lot of one great less lessons. person. <laughs> you're like, there's really only two of us today. I know, but we didn't know. We didn't know you were out yeah. until it started to break up later on because the yeah. race went out slow. Shalane and I led it for a half mi- for a half marathons. And I thought, oh, my God, we're going to run away with this. And then they started racing. <laughs> I feel like that's how Rio was, too. We we're like being so smart. We we're running the tangents mm-hmm. like everyone else is running long. We're like, we're freaking killing it. Like we're running less. We're running smarter. It was like, boom. <laughs> yeah. But look at what happened at Rio. You guys weren't. It was not a level playing field. So. Are they ever? Anyhow. They're not. <laughs> okay. So wait, we. so do we want to go right into the marathon or do you want to hit on Eugene having the champs again? Let's talk about Eugene having the champs again. I think that's interesting. I do too. <clears throat> Tell me what your do you thoughts. Think? Um, it's a mixed bag. Like I feel like they get a crowd. There's obviously a fan base there that's interested. Um, I think that's a product of them always having it. So you can kind of create that fan base um but i think it needs to be spread and that's the question of like is anyone else interested where else would Mm -hmm. it do well um people want la and new york to care but there's so much going on in those cities that like doesn't matter can you get people to go i think that's kind of the appeal of eugene is like it's the only thing going on right I think I I think the the volunteers and the fans in Eugene are amazing, and there isn't another place like that in the United States, at least not right now. It's the facilities, best in the world. I think one of the things that I struggle with is it's really hard to get there, and it's very expensive to get there and to be there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm like, are we then are we really opening up accessibility for people to come watch this, or even athletes to travel that don't have big sponsorships? Um, I would love to see it move around, but I agree with you. We know that they're, it's going to pack there. We don't know it's going to pack anywhere else. And so then I think like, well, how could we make that happen? Like maybe we could have a meet. I mean, I know what Chris will say because Chris McClung, our <laughs> editor, lives in Austin, but I actually feel like Austin would pack it. And I feel like you could, you could, and, and even in New York or LA, let's work with the high schools. Let's make sure any high school track and field athlete gets a ticket. It's just free. You just get to go. Um, I think that I love Eugene and I don't want to crap on Eugene. I know a lot of people do. I, I, I love the history. I love what it stands for, but I don't think that helps us necessarily grow our sport when it's always in this far off place. I wish we could see it move around a little bit more, have fresh new eyeballs on it, more youth from across the country, be able to like, it's one thing to see it on TV, which is great, but it's another thing to be there, right? And feel it. And so I wish we could move it around. I don't have a lot of hope that we will, but I wish we could. What would be your number one city to see it land? You said Austin. I just think Austin, like, would I mean, I would love to, I mean, I would love to see it a lot of places. Like, I think Minneapolis could do a really great job, (laughs) you know? Um, But it's just, 
I think it's like playing with the time of year and who you can get there. I think we can charge for some tickets, but we have to be realistic that it's probably not going to sell out. So then how do we still get people in? And that's where I feel like collegiate high school athletes, why aren't we just opening the doors to them and letting them see and come? I, for like, for me, it would be great if every year it could move, right? Like we're on the West coast, then we're kind of down South, then we're on the East coast, maybe we're in the Midwest and we're constantly kind of moving it and we're getting fresh eyes and more kids are able to experience it and more fans. I mean, every time I say something like this, people are like, Oh, no one comes. But I'm like, well, that's like, not that. like, but we could, we could do something to get people to come. What about you? Like, would you, where would you want to see it if it's not Eugene? That's a great question. I mean, I think that there's like, places that are interested in running and we see that with the roads right so Mm -hmm. like can you pair that up in any way Mm -hmm. and then it becomes a timing issue like well what's really happening in the summer when this is going on but like i mean i thought atlanta did a really good job with that street meet and they promoted it really well um i know boston's done street meets before they obviously have a knowledgeable fan base but where's the stadium um yeah i don't know i just think that we can partner with something that already exists or like at least a fan base that already exists and like sell to that market to start. Yeah. Um, And I I think the other thing is getting eyeballs on TV too. I don't know what those numbers are, but like if that product gets better and I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying, can it be better? Can we show more? Can we have a longer time frame to tell, tell the stories better? Um, Then does that make people want to go and sit in the stands? Right. But again, it has to be feasible financially. So Right. What about like where they hold pen relays? Right. There's like so much history there and it's a good setup for fans and easy act like lots of hotels and I don't know. I just right. I just feel like we've convinced ourselves that the only place that can do it is Eugene. And I do think that we should be using that facility. It's the best facility in the world, but I do I like what you're saying. Like there is a fan base in Boston and New York. So how do we make sure that they're in tandem and they know what's happening? Like the New York runners, all those people who are running their races, like how do we get them to go out to Icon Stadium and like watch the track meet or with Boston? Again, I'm not sure where the track would be there either, but I just feel like we've accepted this as like Eugene's the only place. And I'm like, well, when did that happen? When did we decide that they're the only place? And and this is not to diss on their fans. Their fans are awesome. They are knowledgeable. And their volunteers are sensational. But it, I, we could share the love. Imagine U.S. championships and Peachtree in tandem. That would be like, awesome. Right? How many runners yes. do Peachtree? Crazy. That's a Right. Huge... And then they could maybe Peachtree's first and then everyone comes to the meet or vice versa, right? Like you run Peachtree, you get a ticket into the U.S. championships. People are going to do that. I mean, not all of them, but people are. Build a track, Atlanta Track Club. Yes. Atlanta Track Club. Where, where are we at? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, that's no they do a great job. They've, they've built a huge running community down there. So, mm-hmm. um, What else? Anything else on that? No, that's kind of how I feel. I wish it's, it'll be good. They always do a good job, but I wish it's, it's just getting so expensive and I wish we could just share the love a little bit. Will you, when you're out there, do you go like, take a day off and go wine tasting? Not for the U.S. championships, but yes, for the trials in the world championships last year. We have a day off in the middle. There is no day off this year um, at the world championships, which is fine. But I have my old neighbors both times came and took Adam and I and took us Mm -hmm. wine tasting. So shout out to Annie and Matt Hemmiger. They came and (laughs) picked us up and took us. It was really fun. Will you call the world championships from Budapest? Probably not. Yes. Oh, nice. Yeah. That'll be good. Yeah, I mean, I won't see anything because it's like morning and evening <laughs> sessions. Everyone's like, you're going to Budapest. I've always wanted to go. And I'm like, well, me too, but I'm just going to see. I mean, it'll be will, great. Will the family but... go out? No, because Colt starts school, school during, like he starts school right before World Championship starts. So actually I'm having like a lot of mom guilt because I'm going to miss the first day of school. Um, but they came to World Champs last year, which was super, super fun. You know, my husband is, you know, he raced at the World Championships many times. He's an Olympian. But he's a little jaded on the sport. And it was really cool to get him back into the environment and kind of be able to appreciate what he did. And then it was fun because I think I've talked about this, but Colt came too. And we thought he was going to care about the distance races, but actually he was captivated by the throws. Um, so it just was really fun. And it was like 
good for Colt to see what mom and dad used to do. And it was good for Adam to be like, wow, I mean, I used to be like pretty effing good, you know? <laughs> so I'm hoping that if, I, if I'm working in Paris, they, they're hoping to come to a day or two of that too. Nice. Yeah. And who, you don't have to answer this if you can't, but who's calling the races with you? Who's doing play-by-play? It's the same team uh, as the last couple of years at the championship. So Lee Diffie is our head. And then sprints is Sonia Richards-Ross and Otto Bolton. And then field is Paul Swangard and Trey Hardy. Okay. So you haven't, you, will you do the Diamond League with Paul? I'm doing the Diamond League with Paul. I'm doing one this week with Paul. Paul's Sorry. like the whole I've main, messed up the timing on this. No, it's okay. <laughs> Paul is the main play-by-play for yeah. like everything but basically yeah. USA's and Worlds. Otherwise, he's okay. the guy. Yeah. And is Lee, like, is he pretty, he obviously seems prepared and ready to go and knows, but like, does he appreciate the distances? Or are you teaching him or is he like, work, like, how does that work? He's he, just teeing you up. You know, he had called world champs before I joined the team. Mm-hmm. Um, and he definitely appreciates the distances. He has, it's kind of funny because I know his favorites are and I know the ones he doesn't <laughs> like as much. Um, and you know, he has like, he loves one of our U.S. distance stars, but I won't say it, but um, it's it's pretty cool. But I feel, you know, when I started there, it would be interesting to know what you thought. I, you know, I'm a little jaded. I have walls up. I expect when I go into spaces that are like kind of men's spaces that I'm going to be talked down to a little bit. So my first job with the team, I was like, here we go. They're all going to like talk down to me. And, and And I've never experienced that at NBC. So I feel really grateful. And I feel like, like Lee is, amazing at what he does, but he totally respects what I, what I like my insights. Yeah. So that for me has been awesome. And same with Paul. I mean, Paul's like, Paul, I don't know how he does it. He calls a race like every day. Hour. <laughs> it's, it's insane. Yeah. And he's just, he's such a natural and it's yeah. like, I could never do that. And I would, would you ever want to be play by play? No. I mean, if I did like two races a year, if it was like the marathon, I could probably right. like, but it's a lot of talking and it's mm-hmm. a lot of prep. And then it's like your you have job, to know everything. Yeah. Your job is to make your analyst sound like a genius. Yes. So like teeing it up and like, yeah, you just have to know all of it. I couldn't do it. Yeah. And how was your experience? What was the first race you called? Um, it was. Well, that was the, or- the marathon project. Tech- but what was yeah, your Tech- first project. like call with like the team, the ba- NBC team? The uh, New Balance Indoor it was so fast. It was so short. And like, <laughs> I was doing like 800 with auto in a three person booth. And like, just happened. <laughs> like, it was just like totally different speed. Yeah. As well. But I mean, everyone was like, let's get on a call. Like, ask me all the questions you want. Here's what you should know. Here's what you shouldn't be doing. It was almost like that was like too much. You're like, just yeah. like, the key things first. And then let me get those right. And they're like, yeah. we don't have time for that shit. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I know. But everyone's super helpful and yeah. everyone wants you to do well because otherwise the, the show yeah. has like a bad point and they everyone considers the show the show, right? So I think that was one thing that it's a lot harder job than people think. That's one thing I learned a lot harder. Like you just said, there's a million things going on. It goes by so fast. and You do all this prep and then it's like just done. Um, and it's way harder than I thought it was going to be. And the people are so much nicer than I thought it was going to be. It made me realize like, wow, I'm kind of an a-hole. Like I've really decided that ev- – like I had put on this cloak of like everyone's going to be mean to me all the time and I'm just ready for it. And I was like, I think I should take that off a little bit because people are not just rude. I didn't think they'd be a-holes. I just thought they'd be like way too cool. Yeah. You know, like we're like good at this. We're like – they're just like cool. Like yeah. if I were looking at Otto, he's a cool guy. Sonia yeah, he is. is super cool. Up, uh, yeah, Trey, she's the cool. coolest. Like yeah. they wouldn't have time to like engage with me or anything. Yeah, like that. they were like, oh, you know, like let yeah. me help you out. I'm like, whoa, I'm sorry, you're way too cool for right, me. Right. <laughs> you talking <laughs> to me? Wait, are you sure? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Well, That's someday funny. it would be fun to be on a call with you. We'll keep plugging away on this podcast and see what it turns into. <laughs> okay, I totally hijacked your your topic here because I made us go back to world champs, and then we got lost on broadcasting. But yeah, no, that's okay. These are um, they should go where they go. There's no um, traffic pattern here. So uh, where do you want to go next? <laughs> well, we're, well, I think that you want to go to our team. Where are we at? Um, okay. Do you want to talk about this year's? We ha- we know the world championship team for the marathon. They've been announced. I yeah, think we should give, give a little love. bit of background information. Um, yeah. Let's let's start with 
Well, we did the track events on our last episode, and we started with the ladies first, as we technically should. But I think we should go the other way for this so that we can get more time on the end to talk about the ladies for longer. <laughs> okay. So the men's team is Elkana Kibet. It's a 210.43 personal best. Uh, Zach Panning, 209.28 at last year's Chicago. And Nico Montez, 209.55. He's on the Mammoth Track Club. Um, it's kind of a steady Eddie, huh? Just been yeah. plugging away for a while. So it's a really solid team. I think if you looked at the descending order list, I think Zach was like the fourth fastest in the country last year. And Nico was right behind him. So I, like that's a pretty top tier group. I think so too. But I also think there are names that we don't know as well or the general public doesn't know as well. So it's a good opportunity for them to kind of go feel, feel what that's like to have the media write about you and pay attention to you. And also, I just think the experience is so, so important. If any of these guys land on the Olympic team, they're going to be so glad they ran this. And it's that's like a very real possibility. All three of them yep. are going to be contenders. Um, I think I think Akana has been on a few teams prior, so he's, he, has. he knows what that's about, and like he's just a pros pro. So I think if I were like concerned about anything for me, he'd be a guy to keep an eye on. Like, okay, let's just kind of key off of him to a degree for a while, um, or like even when you get out there and you're in the athlete's village, quote unquote, or the hotel or whatever, it's like. What's this guy doing? He's a guy who can mm -hmm. show me around. Because um, I don't think Nico's been on a world team yet, and I believe this is Zach's first world team. So that's so movies. exciting! I know it's exciting. Yeah, and like sometimes going and having this experience, it sort of changes the way you look at yourself. You know, you're like, well, now I went and I literally ran with the best in the world, so I'm gonna look at myself that way. Like it could really do a lot. I think for their mental game heading towards the trials, having this experience and running against the best and being one of the best. Yeah, mixing it up for sure. But even just the experience of like, hey, you got to go through team processing. Like you're going right. to go out and get all the gear. You're going to go out and you're going to like go to team meetings, like Team USA meetings before the event starts. And we're going to have maybe there's a training camp for Budapest. Uh, you guys can go out to that. And um, Zach Panning runs for Hanson's. And I know they're like, really big on world championships and having a great showing there. And they already took him out to Budapest to check out the course. Like oh, wow. he's going to yeah. know all the turns and like be able to come back and train with that in his mind. So that taking that sort of experience and then applying it to the trials and then hopefully the games, like that's a, I think that's a huge um, bonus for him. Like that's a, gives him a big advantage. I think so too. Maybe you want to talk about this later, but. Actually, yeah. Let's talk about the women first, and then I have a question for you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the women's team. You Do you want to give the women's team? No, no. You do it. All right. We have former American record holder Kira D'Amato, 219.12. This is her PB. Um, she'll run July 4th, I think, or this weekend coming up, uh, Gold Coast Half. So yeah. So we'll get a really good indicator of where she's at. She could challenge the American record there. That course is super fast. Um, and the weather is always good. It's just like if you got the travel out of your system. Right. So that'll be fun to watch. Lindsay Flanagan, 224.43. She ran that at Gold Coast, if I'm not mistaken, last year. So that was a great run for her. She's kind of been on fire. Like I feel like she's been tinkering with that 226 and mm -hmm. 225 and just chipping away at it. So we'll yeah. see what she can do. Um, I don't know if she's been on a world team before. I she I want done? to say no, but okay. I don't know why. But I I could be wrong because, like you said, she's been in that range that gets selected for a while now. Oh, I'm going to look that up before we end the call. Okay. Just because I mean, I need to know. Um, and then Susanna Sullivan, who is a TCS ambassador or sponsored athlete, um, but looking for a shoe sponsor, like in the works, I believe. Um, 224.27 was top 10 in London, I believe, at that mm -hmm. time. And so she should not have any trouble landing a deal. It's going to be what's the right deal. Right. Um, that's Because she's guess. not even like a full-time athlete. She is a full-time – she's a teacher, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is so cool. I, I mean, <laughs> I could never do that. I could not teach all day and then either train before or after. Like I don't have – I'm just – I'm not that tough, honestly. But I think that's a really good, cool story. Like she gets to put on and represent, put on the kit and represent Team USA this summer. And 
224, 27. I mean, <laughs> that's faster than I ever ran. Yeah, that's so, no joke. Pretty legit. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I actually ran with her a few weeks ago. It was my oh. it was my first week back running. And I was like, can we just go really easy? Because like just getting into this thing. Um, she's like, yeah, sure. So we could start. And she was like, how far do you want to go? Like I didn't even ask. And I was like, oh, eight miles would be great. That would be enough. And then she's like, okay, perfect. And then we're running, running, running. She's like, oh, we got to flip. And I'm like, okay, great. And then I was like the last couple of miles. We were running easy enough. But the last couple of miles, I was like, don't look at your watch. <laughs> don't look at your watch like just like try to engage Suck her in conversation i'm it. like asking her all these questions so she would talk the whole time <laughs> and then we finished and it was like 12 it was an 11 mile run and i was like oh thank god i like thought i was dying after eight it was way too much for me um but i did like i got to pepper her with questions the whole time because i was dying and so i was trying to get her to talk so i learned a lot about her but um yeah her story is amazing and she is teaching and she'll have the summer break to really get ready for this and then i think the world championship lands like first week of school like colt that's <laughs> so crazy interesting to see yeah well that's um, a good reason to be late late to work yeah absolutely representing you know the united states at the world that's championships kind of a big deal yeah and this will be great international experience for her mm -hmm. um i mean she ran london obviously but another one like with a bit bigger field and all the things we're talking about with world championships like getting that under her belt like great uh, shot to make a team, you know. Yeah. Were you surprised to see Kira D'Amato say yes to the team again for the second year? Only not oh, no, only because she talked about it prior. <laughs> she was like, "I'm definitely taking that." Um, I think that experience was just really cool in Oregon, and I wonder like what the contractual stuff is there, where mm. you go like, oh, like maybe a medal bonuses is awesome from her contract. Um, she could certainly run a fall. Uh, I, I don't know many Americans will run New York because it pushes up really close to the trials. Um, and then you have sort of larger pool for Chicago. So like, how does that work with negotiations? And then are you like, well, I'd rather just run a little bit earlier, take a break and be ready for the trials. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, but I think that there's obviously the component of World Marathon Majors, appearance money, going to that versus a world championship, like the earning prospects are different, which yeah. maybe a lot of people don't understand, but there's certainly some of that going on. The field at world championships last year was so small in comparison to years past. And it was kind mm -hmm. of like this culmination because there was like Europeans and Commonwealth and world championships last year. So the field was so small. So that that's not to say up front it wasn't fast as heck it was so i'm not <laughs> yeah. saying it was like not a good field it just wasn't necessarily as deep mm -hmm. so it'll be interesting to see her take another swing at this with a field i mean she ran so much world champs by herself like just totally by herself and so and hopefully this year there'll be more people she also had like the late call up right yeah it was mm -hmm. molly seidel was on the team and then couldn't make it to the start so she gets like are you ready we're, yeah. we're going in three weeks. And she was like, okay. And she I'll had spent her summer like doing <laughs> speed work. And then she was like, yeah, I'll do that. I'll represent Team USA. So now she'll be much more prepared, I would think, this time around. Obviously, she's running a half. She's yeah. been more focused on it this year. And maybe that factors into the decision too, right? Like last year, I was this place. I ran this fast. And like I did it off a really short buildup. So I want to go and see where I can land. And can I be on that podium? Like for you, do you think, this is what I was going to ask you earlier, seeing these people who chose to run this versus running a major, I'm just curious because you're still competing, the mindset of like they're going to be racing a month earlier than everybody else at least because what people are going to run Berlin and Chicago, but like you said, probably not New York or not very many anyway. So is there this benefit of not only getting the experience, but also getting one more marathon in before the Olympic trials and having more time? from the trials or do you think that doesn't really matter because these other marathons have plenty of time to recover and get back up for the trials? I think there's plenty of time to recover, but I think the experience gained from this, like you can't put a price on, I mean, and Kira's already got it. And then I think every, or Elkana as well, but for the rest of them, like the other side of it is if you don't make the Olympic team, well, you got to be on a world team. You got to go through that process. You got to represent your country. 
Um, like that's, that's huge. That's really cool. I think like I look at Zach Panning situation and I think this is so smart for him. Like he's run Chicago twice. You have the Pacers, you lock in, you get familiar, you get comfortable. Um, this will be his third marathon, I believe. So if he skips this, he's going into the trials as his third marathon, like relatively inexperienced. So, um, when I was on Hanson's, I did Boston to get my qualifier. And then my second marathon was the trials. I was in the lead group, blew up, finished 13th. Uh, Brian Sell had done Chicago as his qualifier. His second marathon, he went to the trials, was the year he led through like 22 miles, blew up, ironically finished 13th. Um, Jake Riley, I think he got two under his belt and then had a moderate trials. I think he might have like, don't quote me on this, but he might've finished around 13th in, in, uh, LA and all of those situations. I was like, we all needed just a little bit more competitive experience. And I think that Zach having this un under his belt will like give him a huge advantage going into the trials. So like I would, depending, not even depending on how he does, he's a 209, 28 guy. Like he's one of the best in the country. Like he would be on my list of like breakthrough that should surprise nobody, but will probably surprise a lot of people at the trials. Yeah. So. Look at that. The inside scoop. There you go. That was good. <laughs> Every now and then I, I come up with a good story. <laughs> I redeemed myself from if you build it, they will come. <laughs> That's never going to get old. I actually can't wait to tell Adam about that. I was like, where's she going with this? That's not naughty. And then I was like, oh, there it is. There, there it, is. it is. I love it. Okay. And someone can take that. Like, you know, if I haven't gotten around to, you know, setting up the account and you're like, I just love this idea so much and it could be super lucrative, like, go ahead and start it. I won't be yeah. upset. Run with it. Well, they could give you credit for it or something. Yeah. No, I don't even need credit. I just want to see it. I just want to follow that account. <laughs> okay, so since we're talking about this and you're still in this racing mode, do you think, I mean, some people are going to run New York, mm -hmm. but do you think for yourself, New York is too close to the Olympic trials? That's a really funny question because like, just because I'm like old school now and I like regular flats and all of these things and like, so yeah, I would be like, no, I wouldn't. I, I probably shouldn't even do a fall, to be honest. That's like my old school mentality. Then I was talking to someone about this and like people considering New York and they're like, dude, you recover so quick from the new shoes. Like, It's really not that problematic. So it would kind of be like, would you run a half marathon before the trials? Hmm. Why, like, why wouldn't you? Who cares? Um, so I do think the recovery component is just better with the new product. Uh, and so I think everyone should go and run New York. <laughs> <laughs> See what I did there? With a little <laughs> wink there. Wait a minute. <laughs> go take your checks. <laughs> I like it. That's good. Yeah. Um, yes. All right. So what do you think other beyond this, uh, the marathon team, which I think is great. I think we have, I think Kira is a medal contender. And I think everyone else is a comp experience um, cultivator. You know, maybe yeah. on the right day you're in the top 10. I could see that. I mean, it's a um, marathon, so you never truly know. But I absolutely. think on paper, yes, Kira is the one that has a shot to come home with the medal. But, you know, Lindsay and Susanna are not that far out. And just like you said about Zach Penny, I mean, 209.28, it just depends on how the race is run. But I would think that Kira is probably the one going in hoping to come back with the medal. Yeah. Of all wouldn't, of them. Like you wouldn't be totally blown away if that happened. Right. Like, yes, for sure. That's in yeah. the wheelhouse. Um, getting off the marathon a little bit, and I don't know if I can do this, if this is allowed or not, but do you think on the distance side, we don't know our teams, but knowing who's lining up to make our teams, what do we think in terms of medals? Like, should we be going like a couple coming home or are we kind of getting experience? Um, what does that crew look like? It's hard. It's it's hard. I always feel like everyone's like, wah, wah, because the sprints we expect to win like 30 medals in the distance. I'm like, you don't understand. If we win one, that's amazing. I do think we have some contenders though. I do think, again, this we don't know who's on the team, so I'm really just like letting my – I'm going to just let it go. I think Sinclair Johnson has a shot in the 15. 
I think Yard Nagus is a definite medal contender in the men's 15. In the women's steeple, it's gotten so fast up front. So it mm-hmm. takes like a perfect Emma Coburn or a perfect Courtney Frericks, I think. Not that it can't happen, but we're seeing that sub nine right from the gun, and that's tough. Um, in the men's steeple, that would be tough, I think. Um, yeah. Because we just had another world record in the men's steeple. I just think that that event is going new places. Not that it couldn't happen. Uh, 5,000, I think we have an outside chance in both the men's and women's, depending on what kind of shape Cranny and Schweitzer are in and Munson. I think if Grant Fisher was fifth a year ago and Kincaid's beating him, I would not think that Grant Fisher is suddenly out of it, but I would think you have to now add Kincaid as a possibility. And then I would just say the same thing in the 10. I think you know, it's it's hard because Carissa, I, I can't remember if she was eighth or ninth at World Champs last year, but she ran so well. And so it's hard to describe to people like, yeah, she got eighth, but, you know, because they just see the places. It's <laughs> right. like if you look at the time she was there, she was in it. She just lost it over the final lap and a half. So, again, it just kind of depends on who makes our team and, and which version of that athlete shows up. Would you agree with that? I agree with all that. I think like when you look at the depth and we're talking about like who's going to make the team, it's so dense and the players are all really, really good. So you take that and you move it on and like you think someone's going to have sort of that pop out breakout performance at the world champs and that's going to be significant. I think one thing like most of the names you mentioned have Olympic experience, Mm -hmm. they have world championships experience, like they're not going in as like, oh, let me figure out what this world championship thing is about. Um, So I think every time you get the uniform and you're on a team, like the you level up and it's not like, well, I'm happy to be here or I want to be in the top 10 or I want to make the final. It's like this year is the year that those same players start thinking like, I should be meddling. This is where I expect to be. And so that's been fun to watch sort of that group of people evolve. Mm -hmm. And then I think there's going to be some surprises at USA's. And I know this has already happened, but I think that there's going to be some people are getting their feet wet in the championships for the first time, like, like the marathon side where it's like, okay, let's experience this now and then be ready for the games, like really to hit it there. So I was on a call with NBC yesterday and they were talking about how With no off year, because even though COVID year became an off year, but nobody knew it was going to be an off year. So everyone trained all winter and spring as if it was going to be a regular year, right? And then we had the Olympics in 2021. 22 was supposed to be an off year, but it wasn't. It was world champs, world champs this year, Olympics next year, world champs in 25. And it was interesting because they were talking about how the sprint, some of the sprinters are like not really focusing on this year. And, and maybe might not even run at world champs because they're tired mentally. But on the distance side, we are, we're seeing people just run out of their minds all year long. And I don't even know what I'm asking you, but it, it's interesting to me. Like, why are the distance athletes going after world records and personal best and aggressive t- pacing? And we're seeing some of the sprinters like be really choosy when they race. Like, I'm actually only going to race three times this year because I need to be ready for Paris. So I, I mean, isn't distance running really hard too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. I was actually thinking about um, sort of this Twitter conversation with Michael Johnson and then uh, the Emmanuel, mm-hmm. I don't know his last, Achu, Achu? Uh, yeah, I, I say, say Achu, but I have no idea. God bless you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I have beef with him because he actually called Justin Herbert a social media quarterback and it was like this big thing and Justin Herbert is like my boy so like I can't take anything he says seriously but this conversation was pretty good and he had the thing about like a minimum like number of times competing and it was like they need to be eight and it's interesting you bring that up because I was thinking about it on my run it was like well that's super easy for the sprinters like they're not going to have any trouble covering that number but then like you're actually seeing like the distance runners that's insane if you're a 5k runner like you'd have to split it with the 15 or you know like It just doesn't make sense. But what you're saying is like totally counter to my argument in my head as I was running. Like we are seeing them compete quite a bit. And I don't like I I'm fascinated by the why because I don't have an answer. And I mean, it's great. I think 
more times we people we see people compete, the better we get to know them. We understand what they're about, their strengths, their weaknesses, and then we want to see like the most exciting matchups. So yeah. I don't know why it's happening, but I'm all for it. Let's let's keep it up. I am too. And just like as a PSA, like track and field is track and field. And just because a sprint star isn't racing doesn't mean the sport is dying. Right. There's a, like we, there's been a, <laughs> a lot of world records in the distances this year. There's been three, I think. And so, you know, like there's there's still a lot of really cool stuff happening in track and field. Just because the sprinters aren't some of the big names are choosing not to race as often, it doesn't mean we're, the sport's going to die. There's also like other really exciting races, and maybe by some of those sprinters deciding not to race, they're giving someone else an opportunity to really develop and catch them off guard because they're getting in there and getting experience and they're hungry. So just, you know, there are throwers, <laughs> there are jumpers, there are people who run farther than 400 meters and that's, it's all good. All of it's good. Right. What event are you most excited for at the world championship and why? Single event. You had to pick your favorite. I think I'm like, feel bad saying this because I'm all about like women, but the I men's 1500. It's going to be the same. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's just going to be so good. I, yeah. I do think that, um, unfortunately, Waitman's probably out. He just pulled out of the meet on Friday, those on meet, and he's the reigning champion, but there's just a lot of rumors about injury. So that to me is sad because that added just a whole nother layer of he, you know, he nabbed Ingebrigtsen last year when Ingebrigtsen was on top of the world. So, um, but I just think it's so deep and everyone, like everyone's hitting, like sometimes you have like mm -hmm. a couple people hitting and a couple people that had hit last year, but aren't really look, like this year. It's like, everyone's just insane every time they run and take away the pacers and, you know, people have to use some strategy instead of just kicking the last 200. Not that that's easy, but take away that, that, that pacer light or that person in front of you. Now they have to really think a little bit more. I think that's, that's the race I'm most excited for. Oh, I, I totally agree. And I think on top of that, like you have these really <clears throat> big personalities and they're not shy about expressing what they want to get done, where they're going, like where their beef is. Yeah. Um, so it's super compelling, obviously watching the racing, but the personalities and sort of that chemistry on the track is, it, it's really fun to see. And it's great because they're not dodging each other. They're like, let's no. go. Let's Diamond League. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, championships. Let's go. It's they just match up and, and want to have really good races. And that's awesome. I feel like that's been some of the talk this year is the sprinters are dodging each other, this and that. But I feel like in the distances, people are just going against each other. And I love that. And I, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for, I mean, I'm excited for all the races, but that's the one I'm like, Ooh, that's going to be so good. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Love it. That was my last question for the podcast. Do you have anything else you want to get into? I don't think so. You did a All good right. job. Thanks. We did a good job. <laughs> Yay. Well done. Another yeah. episode. <laughs>